At nearly 5,000 feet in elevation, the climate in this desert mountain landscape creates the right conditions for several unique wild edible plants to flourish. The first plant was difficult for me to identify. There are many similar plants in the same family, but with the help of viewers like you, I finally identified this elusive species as Cymopterus multinervatus. Its common name is Purple Nerve Spring Parsley. In late winter, it emerges from the earth with round purple flower buds. Now it is spring and the flower head is dry and discolored. But what I'm mostly interested in is what lies beneath the soil. Purple Nerve Spring Parsley appears only for a few months, beginning during the winter rainy season, and the foliage quickly fades away and dies in the spring. The root remains alive in the ground as it awaits for its chance to grow again the following winter. Purple Nerve Spring Parsley has a thick taproot similar to a carrot that is not only edible, but actually quite tasty. Usually I find the root of this plant deeper in this rocky earth, but this one was growing very shallow and was easy to dig up. The outer skin of this root can easily be scraped away with a fingernail or a stone, thus revealing the starchy white interior of this nutritious root. This plant is in the carrot family, and like a carrot, the main edible part is the root, and it can be eaten raw. I wasn't able to find any nutritional data about this plant, but I assume it is a good source of carbohydrates and certain minerals. The dense calories in the roots make this an important survival food in a land with such limited food resources. Purple Nerve Spring Parsley is available year-round, but the plant is undetectable for most of the year because the leaves and flowers dry out in the spring and are blown away by the wind, leaving no trace of the plant visible on the surface of the earth. The taste of the root is similar to parsnips. It has a very pleasant flavor. It's not as crunchy as a carrot, nor as sweet either, but for something eaten straight out of the dirt, it is quite good. I imagine it would be very good cooked in a stew with rabbit or some other animal. I imagine this root can be stored for at least a few days in the shade. Next winter I will search for denser populations of this plant. I also want to try cultivating the seeds to see if I can successfully increase the availability of this wonderful wild food source. A short walk east from my hut I find another wild edible plant called Rumix aminocephalus. Its common name is desert rhubarb or wild rhubarb. It grows in an area that receives a lot of drainage from rains and the soil is much softer than that on the hills. In early winter, the purple leaves of the plant emerge from tubers beneath the soil. As they grow, the leaves turn a deep green color. In early spring, the plants are nearly fully grown and a flower stalk begins to form. This is the time that I like to harvest the juicy leaf stalks. During days in the spring, the weather is already hot and dry. This is when I look for desert rhubarb specifically to quench my thirst. Desert rhubarb is high in calcium oxalates, especially in the leaves. Consuming a lot of calcium oxalate crystals can cause some medical problems for humans. One common problem is kidney stones that can result from calcium oxalate crystals accumulating in the urine. Over the years, I've eaten a few different plants of the Rumix genus, and I've never had a kidney stone. But I only eat them occasionally and only in the spring when they are naturally available. The leaf stalk of desert rhubarb is said to contain less calcium oxalates, so that is the only part that should be eaten of this particular species. I read that desert rhubarb is a good source of vitamin A, but I only eat it for the water content. Then I discard the stalk fibers and leaf on the ground. It also has a delicious sour flavor that is desirable on hot days. Although the roots are not edible, they do have medicinal purposes and can also be used as a dye. By late spring, the plants have completely withered as they await the following winter to grow again. After the rhubarb has died off in the heat of spring and in the same general area, another plant produces a very tasty fruit commonly known as agarita. In Spanish, this basically means to grab you lightly, which is what the plant does while collecting the fruit. The thorny holly-like leaves grab onto skin and clothing. This makes gathering the fruit a slow and tedious process. Mahonia trifoliolata is the botanical name for agarita. It may also be known as wild currant or chaparral berry. This plant very closely resembles Berberis hematocarpa, which is commonly known as red barberry. It's difficult to distinguish between the two. The plant looks similar to a scrub oak, and the fruits start to ripen here at the end of May and early June. 
A tightly woven basket is ideal to collect the tiny berries. It could take a few hours to fill this one basket. This fruit is delicious to eat raw. It has a tarty flavor and small crunchy seeds inside. The fruits can be dried for later use, used to extract juice, and even to make a wonderful flavored wine. I read that the berries are also used to make jellies and pies. There is a decent amount of water in this fruit, which makes it very desirable on hot days and helps quench the thirst. Consuming a handful at a time is the best way to fully enjoy this wild fruit. I didn't find any nutrition data about this fruit, but I bet it has a high vitamin C content. The branches and roots of agarita were historically used medicinally and also to make a yellow dye for tanning hides. Some bushes produce bright red fruits and others have orange fruits. I didn't notice any difference in flavor between the two colors. I also observed that some bushes produce no fruit at all. When summer arrives, daytime temperatures often reach 100 degrees Fahrenheit, or 38 degrees Celsius. The hot weather coincides perfectly with another favorite plant of mine that produces reddish-orange sour berries that effectively quench the thirst. Rust trilobata is a common bush in these mountains. The berries start to form in late spring and then fully ripen by the beginning of summer. The common name is sour berry. When ripe, the berries are covered with a sticky sour substance that gives them their distinctive flavor. Under the very thin pulp is a large seed that I do not eat. I have noticed a remarkable observation while eating this fruit when hungry and very thirsty. The sour taste promotes salivation and temporarily relieves thirst. I found that I could continue working for several hours longer without food or water just by regularly eating the berries. I believe that this is just a temporary stimulating effect and that the berries cannot replace the need for food and water. The berries can be dried and stored for a long time too. One of my favorite ways to prepare them is to mix the berries in water. This creates a tasty beverage similar to lemonade. There is so little pulp covering the seed that there is very little nutritional value. I use this berry only for quenching my thirst to help me get through the hot days. The leaves and roots can also be used for medicinal purposes and the flexible branches for making baskets. It is best to gather the berries for storage before a heavy rain because the rain will actually wash away much of the sticky sour substance covering the sour berry, thus making the flavor much less potent. Nature seems to have a way of provision throughout the year because at the end of summer, my favorite wild fruit in the region is ripe and ready to eat. A punti angelmanii, commonly called desert prickly pear, produces the tastiest fruit on the mountain during the hot and humid days of August. The oval-shaped fruits start out green and then slowly turn red and finally purple when they are fully ripe. Prickly pears have clusters of tiny thorns called glochids on their exterior. Glochids can irritate the skin, so to avoid them it is best to remove the glochids with a stick or brush them off with grass. If glochids do get into the skin, they can carefully be removed. They can cause irritation for several hours if not removed. Since prickly pears are much larger than other fruits out here, a larger quantity of food can be collected in less time. Prickly pears are high in vitamin C and magnesium. They also have a high water content which makes them particularly desirable in this hot summer climate. The fruit is delicious when eaten raw, but it can also be cut into pieces and dried for later use. The fresh fruit can only be stored for a few days in the shade before it starts to ferment. The fruit can also be smashed and juice extracted or used to make a tasty fermented beverage. The juice can also be used as a purple dye. The seeds can be swallowed whole or they can be collected, toasted, and ground into flour to be added to other foods. The green pads of desert prickly pear cactus can also be eaten, but it is best in April when the tender young pads grow. The pads can be eaten raw, but have better texture and taste when cooked. Prickly pears and the green pads are both said to be very healthy. They are high in antioxidants and believed to be beneficial for those with diabetes, fatty liver disease, and those with high cholesterol. Some say that eating too many prickly pears can cause diarrhea, or that eating them with the seeds can cause constipation. I have eaten as many as 20 in a day, and I didn't notice any irregularities, but everybody is different. The prickly pears are available here until the end of September. 
After that, there won't be any more sweet fruit until the following year.